We are moving topics a lot. We are moving topics a lot, exactly. Mm -hmm. Good. So, uh, Falco Dressler, he's a full professor at uh, TU Berlin. He received his PhD in 2003 from mm -hmm. the University of Erlangen. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been associate editor in chief for IEEE Transaction oh. Computing. He's been involved in lots of conferences. He's an IEEE distinguished lecturer and IEEE fellow. Um, his main interests are extremely wide, um, include adaptive wireless communications, hertz, military wave, visible light, and even molecular communication, as well as wireless based sensing with application ad hoc and sensor networks, Internet of Things, and cyber systems. So please let's welcome Falco. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, I guess I can take off the mask now, otherwise, I will collapse after, <laughs> after a short while. Um, thanks a lot, uh, first of all, for the invitation here. Very, very kind. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I, I really have to say that I'm so happy to be among people, yeah? so real people. Um, so so, so, so uh, being able, I mean, we just have been on the, in the corridor uh, drinking coffee, chatting, discussing, and this, I was missing this, I have been missing this so much uh, over, the, over the last two years. So very happy being here. Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> it's already uh, mentioned that so uh, topics change slightly, but 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 uh, you will you will see at the the what um, what the end of the talk that uh, maybe there is even still a little bit of an overlap. So I'm not a theoretician. Um, I'm a systems person. So I'm building systems. I'm I'm uh, uh, trying to show off that uh, that our concepts really work uh, in the lab and possibly even in the in the wild. Um, so today I, I'd like to talk, long title, by the way, no, I, I like to talk about, um, uh, uh, well, how vehicular networking um, uh, 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 kind of, kind of uh, converged with what happened in the, in the telecommunication networks, uh, so 5G, um, uh, mobile edge computing, and how they fit together somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, so um, trying to make it fit. Um, let me let me start uh, the presentation with. Um, I have to go to the correct screen here, um, with um, uh, a little bit looking into the past. Now, so what, what happened? Why are we here? Why are we talking about uh, vehicular networking at all, actually? And um, um, so I titled this uh, section "Turning Cars into Interconnected CPS." Now, so how everything started, and um, um, I, I, I used this slide since very very long time already. Um, uh, but I still like it. Um, no, so, so one main motivation for for us working in the field of vehicular communications was actually not communications driven. It was driven, or and still is actually, by autonomous driving. Um, and um, this car uh, that you see on the on the slide, um, probably some of the um, older ones of you recognize. Um, uh, no, there was this uh, big DARPA grand challenge uh, for autonomous driving from the East Coast to the West Coast in the US. Um, in the early days, um, it was terrible. No? So cars made it a few hundred meters and then they crashed. Um, uh, and in the end, they, they succeeded. No? This is the winning car that first made it um, uh, 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 this way. If you look at autonomous cars these days, you see other pictures in the news uh, and eventually even uh, many of them cooperatively driving. Yeah? So this is this is the big uh, challenge and the big thing today, having many cars driving cooperatively in a platoon or in intersection maneuvers, um, and then of course communication kicks in. Yeah? So this is this is one of the one of the main motivations. Um, when, uh, however, um, again looking looking a little bit into the past, the main motivation for wireless communications for cars was not coming from this uh, cooperative driving field, but um, from a field that has been touched multiple times in the previous talks already, and that is safety. Yeah? So we want to have safety messaging. Um, why we want to have this? Um, well, because um, all our sensors, and we have very sophisticated sensors these days uh, in, in all cars. Yeah? If you go to the next dealer, buy a car of your choice, um, you get radars, you get lidars, you get uh, camera-based sensors, 360 degrees. Uh, it's all there. It's in the shops already. Right? It's on the market. Um, but all these sensors are limited to line of sight. So whenever you you use these sensors, you, you only see what you also visually perceive. Right? And um, uh, very nice situation in this in this on the slide here. Right? So the the blue car is your car, at a, whether it's autonomous or you drive it. I don't care. But you see the green light. Uh, you see the car in front of you accelerating. What are you doing? Right? You accelerate as well. Otherwise, people in the back are starting honking. Um, uh, 
but what you don't see visually or by means of your senses that in this very moment the crash happens. Yeah? So you need communications. Huh? Just putting that as a motivation for the, for, the, for the talk. So getting both things together, we are in the field of cooperative autonomous driving and uh, cooperative autonomous driving requires some, some audio on, um, two of which are mature. Yeah? So we can make, kind of use them out of a shelf today. Um, that is this wireless LAN based uh, DSRC version, which is kind of that again. <laughs> so so um, uh, it was already two years ago um, that uh, uh, FCC took away the, the spectrum for, for DSRC in the US. Uh, so in Japan and, uh, and uh, in, 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 in China, it was never the, the main option. So in, in, in Europe, uh, well, there is still, uh, I think one, car maker and one brand of this car maker that is Volkswagen and uh, only one brand in this Volkswagen uh, spectrum, uh, they, they use it. Um, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. So um, officially it's still there in Europe. Um, and the other one is uh, uh, since 5G already the cellular V2X. Yeah? So we can, we can use cellular V2X um, mm -hmm. out of the box, but there are many more, yeah? so many more options at the, at the horizon. Yeah? There is visible light communications uh, for, for Car to car communications. There's millimeter wave communications for for many of these uh, for many of these options. And um, who knows what what people are coming up with next as a as a as a communication option. Let's take all of that together yeah, and um, uh, make it a heterogeneous communication system. Maybe compensating and complementing for deficiencies of these uh, different uh, solutions and so on. Um, we did so. Um, we did so in the simulation, so I hope you can see it on, on, on screen. Um, now you see some cars coming uh, east-west, you see some cars uh, going south-north, and they pass an intersection. Um, and they do so. Uh, so if you look, uh, hey man, uh, works, works, still works. Um, no crash. Um, this only works, first of all, in simulation. Uh, second, um, uh, you're laughing, right? But second, um, because we use two different communication technologies at the same time. So there is this yellow lines, which is a CV2X uh, uh, base station. And there is these uh, red lines, which is DSRC connection between the cars uh, uh, themselves. Uh, and it works perfectly well. Um, again, not, not in real life, uh, in, for real life, I mean, this is centimeters the cars pass. No? So um, in, in real life, you have to have more safety gaps to compensate for, uh, I don't know, maybe some, some interference coming for, for, for whatever reason. No? But um, uh, it, it, in theory, it works. Uh, the problem is making that scalable. Um, you see here eight cars, no? for eight cars, it works. If I even in the simulation put a hundred cars, Sort of getting not so easy anymore, let's say. Um, uh, uh, the more cars you have, we have seen that in the previous talks today, by the way, now, the more interference you get and the more interference you get, uh, you have to compensate again by means, for example, adding more safety gaps between these cars. Um, um, so how do we get it better? How do we make, um, make it um, uh, uh, robust, uh, first of all, and uh, meeting all safety requirements? And for this, I'd like to again, um, I don't know, sidestep a bit um, um, because there's a lot of research in another field um, that has been taking place in the, in the, I don't know, last 10 years probably. Um, and that is actually motivated by, by completely different applications, um, this mobile edge computing. Now mobile edge computing, the main idea of mobile edge computing is a very simple one. How to get cloud service, so compute services, close to the user. So why do you want to get them close to the user? Because of delays. Uh, so this, is, this was the main motivation for, for mobile edge computing. And there's tons of, of, tons of applications for mobile edge computing. Uh, so, so you have, uh, I'm pretty sure, read many, many of these papers already. Um, now, this concept of mobile edge computing is very interesting, actually, for, for this field of cooperative driving, because you get computational services and one of the most important computational services for, for cooperative driving is uh, the field of cooperative perception. Uh, so having sensor data from different cars merging these sensor data so that you get the view what is currently going on. So how can I interpret what is currently going on on this intersection? Uh, so how do I know? Only if I merge sensors, line of sight sensors from different cars to get the full picture. 
Yeah? Uploading all this information to the cloud would be possible. Yeah? So no, no doubt, um, I upload to Amazon Web Services, Google, whatsoever, and I get the information back, perfectly calculated, optimized to the, yeah? um, to the, to the point. The problem is I get it back after, oh, I don't know, a few seconds. <laughs> so so <I'm, laughs> the safety critical situation is over. I, I, I crashed or I didn't mess so, so there's some luck in there possibly. Mm -hmm. um, so edge computing helps because I get the compute power close to the user. So it's directly at my edge and I, I think it's working fine. Sounds good. So it sounds really good. And it would work. I, I promise you it would work. Um, um, and um, um, one of the so so what what are you calculating at this at this at this in this edge computing? Yeah? So mm -hmm. um, you're calculating, for example, the scope of perception. So how do I get the sensor data together? How do you do sensor fusion these days? Yeah? So um, it's too much data. That's lots of data. So you are overwhelmed with data. So now many many of the data analytics concepts are in the eventually today based uh, on machine learning. So you you train heavily train models that are running in the edge locally, hopefully locally, not in the cloud, locally to get low delays. And, but you have to continuously retrain and uh, 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 these models. Now, mobile edge computing helps as well. Why not using mobile edge computing? I'm, I'm very much a fan of mobile edge computing. Um, my, my main problem is that the ISPs are not deploying it. So we're still waiting. Yeah? So we are still on hold. Um, um, so I don't know about um, uh, other countries. I, I, I know a little bit from, from German ISPs. Um, uh, so I, I, I learned two, well, one and a half years ago from Deutsche Telekom that they will deploy 11 edge servers, not in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, yeah, and uh, Vodafone 12. More. More, yes. Yeah, uh, you're laughing. It's, it's, this is really a problem. So where, where do we find these resources? So possible in Berlin is fine. Right? Um, there will be possibly one or two. Even that is not enough for, for all these uh, traffic situations that you have in the city. But other places, you're lost. Paris will also get, I'm pretty sure, one or two. But that's it. Yeah? Um, uh, and um, at the same time, um, this uh, Edge computing supported by the ISP is inherently centralized to this ISP as well. So there is no possible collaboration between users. So cars approaching an uh, intersection, for example. Yeah, so cars have to offload their, their data to this edge server. The edge server is doing computing and you get the data back. Possibly you can do even faster and better if you have direct collaboration between the, between the, between the participants. So, this gets me um, to some work that we, that we started two years ago, actually. Some people here in the room, very happy to have uh, Carla and uh, Vincenzo here. Um, uh, so we have, been, we have been working a bit on, on virtualizing all this. Now, so if, if the ISPs don't deliver, we do other ways. We find other ways. Now, why not, why not virtualizing this, this concept of, of edge computer? Now, how do we do that? I mean. Eventually, we need compute resources. So where, where do we find that? Huh? Where do we find that? Um, there are uses. There's many uses. So what you see here on the slide, né? so classical core network on your right-hand side, in the very end, you, you have the cloud. Um, uh, you have the edge network. Mm -hmm. né? So this is the G node Bs in, in 5G. Um, so you have the edge network, possibly with some edge servers, né? possibly with some edge servers. And then you have users. And will these users bring resources no, automatically they bring resources with them if you look into a modern mm -hmm. self-driving car and you have at the moment you have prototypes on the road no, it's not not at least in europe uh, you cannot go to the next dealer buy a fully self-driving car but um, they have at least some functionality already in, in built in no? and if you look deeper into this car what you find as, as resources is you have gpu performance i would love to have in my lab no, so, so you have a lot of resources there, but you don't need 100% of the time for this cooperative driving maneuvers. Sometimes it's just idling around. Why not use this as edge service resources? No? And even much smaller, smaller um, end devices uh, that you're carrying with you all the time, your laptop, your phone, no, modern phone, modern, uh, independent of what plant you have, 
as co-processes for AI. Um, why not using a little bit of these resources and sharing that with others? Uh, um, and yes, I know the argument uh, that, you, that you have in mind already. Why should I share my resources with other people, um, particularly because it also trains my battery? Uh? Uh, maybe you want to have the same thing in the next second. So uh, we find incentive versions for this. Uh, so we will find some, something for this. Um, so, so what is out there? Uh, and so we have this table. So we worked a little bit about this. Um, uh, we have this table and just have, let's, let's um, have a look at um, typical ISP operated mobile edge server. Uh, it gives you, I'm pretty sure, super high multi-core performance for, for, compute, for compute tasks. Uh, it gives you storage in the terabytes. Um, it gives you network connectivity in the 10 gigabit per second. It's perfect. Yeah? But um, if, you, if you switch to, for example, moving cars, yeah? so either moving or parked, uh, low end multi-core system, so not so, not so perfect, um, not so much storage, um, network connectivity, maybe by Wi-Fi, maybe by LTE, so uh, maybe not so, not, so, not so great either. Um, and most importantly, and that is the very right column on the slide, you meet them only for a very limited period of time. Mm. Also, that is something we have seen in the previous talks. No? So cars are moving, so you, they, they are in, in close connect, connection only for a very limited period of time. And I will come back to that massively in the, in the rest of the talk. No? Um, but again, I mentioned um, so fully autonomous uh, cars, no? they, they provide even multi-core, high-end multi-core or GPU services um, uh, that you could use. But also they are very short period in time, maybe a minute, five minutes in your proximity mm -hmm. so that you can do something with them, uh, collaborate with them. Um, I will talk about this time in a second. Um, just one slide uh, to finish this, um, this um, uh, kind of intermediate um, uh, uh, V edge architecture, virtualized edge ar computing architecture um, idea. Yeah, so, so you have resources, you turn your resources into logical resources. If you have logical resources, you can couple them together, uh, um, kind of cluster them. Um, and the challenge, the main challenge is here now, the orchestration part. So when shall I assign which of these resources to which of the uses? Uh, this is a very complicated <laughs> part, by the way. It's a really complicated part. Uh, so some of these cars are doing now this intersection maneuver. They are in need because they are now, now right now, doing a safety critical maneuver. Other cars standing in front of a red light. There is no autonomous driving at the moment. There is nothing. They are standing around, so they can share. So we can identify which is which is more in need than than, than others. Um, and then of course orchestrate all that in a in a in a, in a very efficient way very likely directly supported by centralized architecture, namely the Gnode Bs. Now, even though they don't provide mobile edge compute services, but at least they can provide this orchestration. And um, then it's making optimization at least easier. So let's start with, um, um, let's start with some, some work we did um, uh, over the last uh, maybe so five, six years. Um, and um, we have another guest today um, joining later today online, uh, Uno Altentash. Um, so we have been working a lot with him um, on um, what we call a vehicular micro cloud architecture. And, um, so that was actually our starting point, uh, which possibly ends up in this virtual virtualized edge computing. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but I presented exactly the opposite way because I think it's more, more in, intuitive this way. So what we did uh, together um, is uh, developing an architecture looking like this. Né? So this is a classical edge computing, cloud computing um, uh, architecture that you see. Né? So on the, on the very top, you have some, some backend data services, uh, data centers. On the very bottom, you have the users um, uh, using these data services. Very likely, hopefully, you have some, some edge servers supporting that for, for reducing latencies uh, for all the services that you are providing. And um, our idea uh, already some, time, some years back was um, um, well, maybe combining some of these cars, clustering them together so that you get what we call micro clouds, vehicular micro clouds, and they provide exactly the same thing as the classic edge server. Huh? Um, does it work? Yes, it does. Huh? So, did a couple of papers on this, um, how to do this clustering, how to manage which car belongs to which of these clusters, how to identify 
um, uh, uh, trajectories of these cars and so on. So what you see on slide here is um, typical intersection. So we on purpose locate one of these virtual clouds, these micro clouds on intersections. Now at every car, you see, see different coloring here, right? Every car that is currently part of this, 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 uh, this uh, geographic area around this intersection uh, is turning red. When it comes, it's turning right. It's part of the system. When it goes, uh, it's turning right again. It's no longer part of the system. And then we can do everything we, 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 like in classical distributed computing in this uh, among these these cars joining. Um, so the connectivity is uh, directly between cars plus plus the the five G. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, so the minimum functionality we need is some V2V connectivity um, that can be DSRC. So we started with DSRC many years back. No? So, um, uh, but it can also be um, uh, uh, V2V supported by cellular V2X. Um, uh, it's also also there. Um, and of course, yes, um, at least some of the cars will also have to have an uplink um, by means of LTE, 5G, 6G, whatever it will be. Um, so to provide connectivity to real edge servers and or the cloud eventually. Yeah? But this is a very important, important point. Yes, exactly. Um, so what you see here already is that, let's assume on the, on the east-west uh, 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 street here, maybe they get a green light. So these cars driving east-west, they will be part of this uh, micro cloud for what a short period of time. So how long does it take to drive over this intersection? It's in the order of 10 seconds, 20 seconds, um, uh, well, depending on the speed you're going, of course. No, but in typically urban environment, mm. driving 50 kilometers per hour. No, so north, south, they get, currently have a red light. Right, so they are standing there for a minute or two. That's typical times you, you spend on, 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 on the red light. Um, so obviously there are different there's different contribution possible depending on the mobility of these cars in these situations where they are in, in this, in this, in this micro cloud. And if you have to know about this. Yeah? Um, secondly, what you see is a car that is coming from, from east west is passing through this micro cloud, possibly collecting information from this micro cloud, and then leaving. And this information, we, we yeah spend a lot of communica communication resources to give this information to this car and it's leaving. So it's no longer useful. Is it? Is it like this? I think it's not. No, we have just to step on a little bit back, yeah, get a broader perspective and maybe we can, we can still use it. And that is what we call intermicro cloud coordination. Uh, inter micro cloud coordination. So, um, when we talk about uh, these micro clouds, they are, of course, dynamic. Uh, topology is changing all the time and cars coming and going. The question is can we somehow make use of this information cars already received when they are driving away? Uh, and um, you see here this, um, it's maybe a little tiny, but you see here two neighboring micro clouds and you see a car. A going from the left one to the right one and car B coming from the right one to the left one. Let's zoom in, let's zoom in. I have an animation for this. Um, uh, so if, if we have these cars, they do something in their local micro cloud and then they move off to the other one. While they are moving off, they can just swap. Now they can just swap. Meaning that when they do this, the car arriving to this new micro cloud is already before arriving, it's already a member of it, has some relevant information for it, has some relevant data for it to possibly took over even computational tasks from the other one and can continue providing this, this information um, in, the, in the other one. And now we can scale that to the extreme. Now, so we can do that in large, more complex trajectories of these cars, typically no. Uh, so self-driving car will know anyhow where it's going. Um, uh, when you are driving, I don't know about you. No, I'm, I'm very bad in, 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 in figuring out where I have to go. So I typically use my, my navigation system. My car knows where I'm going, or at least with a high probability. Otherwise, we can have a learning functionality in the car to, to guess where I'm going. Yeah? Um, uh, 
So, so we have this, we have the data in this, this different micro clouds. We know about the trajectories, and then we can pre-compute which data might be useful in the in the, in the next time interval. Um, exchange this information um, between between these uh, between these cars, mm -hmm. so to get a much smoother operation in the in this in this virtualized stage service. Um, yeah, um, let's finish this this animation here. Um, and we can do even even larger. Right? So now you can think of crazy. Right? So uh, I'm going uh, maybe maybe just to the next one or to next next one or to next 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 one. At some point, it doesn't make sense anymore. Right? So because uh, you need, of course, communication resources in order to exchange this data already. So doing uh, not this 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 prefetching of of information that you need in the in the future too extreme. You just waste communication resources. So there's a sweet spot, yeah, possibly. Um, so by the way, for for such an such an scenario, we did some some uh, simulations here, and um, we figured out that uh, so typically n equals two. So two of these these clouds ahead is a good sweet spot for not overdoing communications um, while providing enough information to contribute to the other clouds. You have a question? What about the cloud DMT? How do you resurrect the cloud? Mm -hmm. But assume one of these uh, micro clouds is empty of cars for a while. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you resurrect it? Uh, this is an excellent question. It's an excellent question. Um, we don't. <laughs> and um, the intuition behind so there are two situations. Right? Mm -hmm. um, one situation is um, a car has driven off of this micro cloud, so it's now empty. Uh, meets another car that to which it can take over this information. The other one comes back, so it comes pre compute with, pre, um, uh, with some prefetch data. So then some of this information is is revealed. Um, uh, the other situation is uh, it's just no, nobody there. Huh? But if there's nobody there, so at, keep in mind this vehicular micro cloud architecture that we developed to, together with Toyota is supposed to be from cars, services from cars, by cars, to for cars. So if there's no car, there's no service needed. Why do we need any anybody to, to, to be there? It only matters if you have cars who want to do this uh, cooperative uh, driving maneuvers, who want to do some, some uh, activities there, then you need edge services. And if you need this edge service, then the cars are there already. Uh, um, but you're right. So if nobody's there, there's no cloud. Um, very, very, very simple question. <laughs> you, need a, you need a sort of uh, protocol to initiate a cloud when yes. two cars or one. Yes, right yes, 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 yes. Yes, that is, that is there. Um, no, so so um, uh, all the details are not here in this, in, this, in this short presentation. But yes, there is, of course, how to jumpstart uh, one of these micro clouds. Um, what is the minimum number of uh, participants so that it makes sense to do so? Um, and um, even one more component, and that is therefore a perfect question. Um, that is exactly what I, what I wanted to come to next. Um, you also need information, predictive information on what is your estimation for how long this car will be in this intersection. I cannot treat every car the same. If I do so, um, the system will be working terribly actually. Um, because some of these cars, as mentioned, right, they come for 10 seconds and the other car is standing there for three minutes. And if I don't know, what can I do? Right? The, the system will be at least operating at a, at a very suboptimal uh, 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 operational status. Right? So what I need to know is for how long this car will be there. Eventually, that is called 12 time prediction. So how, how long this car will um, spend in, in, a, in a certain environment. Right? Um, and we tried. Yeah, and what, what we did is uh, we took um, uh, a typical city, a typical European city. Um, it's Luxembourg. Yeah? And why Luxembourg? Um, simply because for Luxembourg, there are very uh, accurately validated models available about mobility of cars in Luxembourg. Yeah? Um, some colleagues from, from Luxembourg, they did some um, uh, studies together with their, with their local municipalities. And um, they got some, some data uh, about um, where cars are driving at which time of the day uh, and so on. So they have very, very accurate mobility models. 
which I don't have for any other city in the world. So that's why we picked Luxembourg, you know, just in, in case you are interested by Luxembourg. So we took this Luxembourg mobility uh, scenario and we let the cars go. You not know, just driving around for a full day, 24 hours. Um, and we um, collected data for how long a car spends at which of these intersections. First, so to get a feeling for how long is a car spending at an intersection. Um, and then we did classical fitting for, for a probability density function. So for, for what is, well, now if I want to model that, mathematically model that, so what is a, what is a good, good starting point here? And um, so we um, uh, took the data, the empirical data we got, uh, we, we checked for many, many, many different um, distributions. And what turned out is um, um, uh, that Johnson SU seems to be a good approximation here. So is it really a good approximation? No, so uh, this is the fitting for the sampled versus the actual data. Um, so sampled using uh, Johnson SU, uh, actual data measured in, in, in Luxembourg. And you see, well, the fit, the, the, the shape of the curve is similar, but no, you will also notice uh, there's a lot of gray areas here which are not perfectly matching. Um, and um, if you have one probability distribution for cars about their 12 times that fits rather well for some of the major junctions in Luxembourg, but you go to one smaller one, totally off. And if I take this model, move it to Paris, to, I don't know, any, any place of your, of your choice, it may work a little bit, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. So 12 time modeling just based on empirical data and um, uh, 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 just uh, uh, fitting for this, for this empirical data to some, some probability density function is maybe not really generalizable. So we learned our, our, our lesson and um, asking ourselves, how can we do better? Mm -hmm. We tried a learning based approach. No? So, it's data analytics in the end. So um, why not why not using a simple learning based approach for figuring out for a particular junction for a particular intersection for how long will cars typically spend at this intersection to prediction right? prediction is the important word here. And what we got finally is by the way the y axis is uh, mean absolute error as a, as a metric. Right? So the larger the worse. So small is good um, for. The heuristic is the very left one and our learning based approach, the very right one. Um, for two scenarios for Luxembourg and Manhattan, just as having a second scenario. Uh, um, and because it's easy to simulate uh, Manhattan grid. Uh, so it's super easy to simulate. Um, and what you see here is for Luxembourg, even for Luxembourg, where we had a perfect modeling of the of the 12 times according to this empirical data. Already here we see the blue curves. Now we see a substantial reduction in in, in error for Manhattan, which is an entirely different world, so to say. The reduction is massive. Now our learning based approach is doing massively better than the than the empirical one. Now the empirical one is even worse than the the for, for Manhattan than Luxembourg because it was not fitted. Now we have no data. This curve fitting was done for Luxembourg, not for New York downtown. Um, um, and um, then we did a lot of more studies, uh, uh, playing around with the, with, the, with the machine learning models, uh, playing around with the different requests in our neural networks so to get better data, uh, to get better, better, better fittings in the end. And you see that even, uh, so this is the learning one, um, if, we, if we use different types of, of, um, of uh, requests in our neural mm -hmm. network, we can do even better. And we did not do that to the very end. Uh, so it's a very preliminary study for, for what we did. And still, we, we did very good already. Now we have a prediction. <laughs> of how long cars spent at this intersection. If we have this prediction of how long cars spent at an intersection, we have a prediction of how well they contribute to our virtualized edge computing. And um, um, uh, well, uh, we, we can hopefully at some point make this edge computing a little bit more reality this way. Huh? So <laughs> in theory, I can already come to conclusions, but, <laughs> but I, I added a little bit more in information, more like a, more like a, for those of you who are interested um, as a, a which playground we use for, for, for doing so, um, 
uh, for this machine learning at the edge. Um, uh, now we, we did many of these um, of these studies in, in simulations. We used uh, very accurate mobility simulation um, using uh, traffic simulators called Zumo. Uh, we used rather accurate um, uh, communications uh, 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 simulation. Um, so we already had that, but um, how do we fit this, this, this learning part in? That's just a tooling perspective. Um, so how do we tackle ITS uh, challenges in general if you have this, this learning in there? So essentially what we can do in, in general is kind of, kind of, kind of uh, decomposing um, what's really happening on the road to what our models uh, eventually decide. Um, now this is our environment, this is the learning agent. Um, um, and we have some observations that we can that we can get. Um, we have to um, compute some actions for this um, and uh, possibly getting some reward. And we designed a, a tool for this, um, which you might be interested in using. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the classical tools for, for simulations of um, mobility, Sumo for mobility, Wayans for, for communications. Um, on the other side, uh, on the learning side, there's typical tools that you find, PyTorch, TensorFlow for, for the learning side. But people are doing data analytics, machine learning, they are very used to this part. Um, the big question is what's, what's in between as a, as a connector. No? Um, um, uh, so what you have to do is uh, eventually getting from this side to this side, mm -hmm. positions, speeds, uh, um, you know, physical data of the, of the cars. And to the other side, you get some, some concrete action, what, 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 what you plan doing. Um, and we, we designed a tool that we called Veins Gym. Um, yeah, so our, our Veins uh, simulator is going to the gym for doing better. Um, I don't know if that's a good name, I, uh, but anyhow. Um, um, uh, we made this open source. So if you're interested in playing around with this, um, it's, um, it's a nice, uh, nice thing that we, that we can, that we can uh, provide at this stage. So now really wrapping things up, um, um, I have two slides for this. Um, the first one is, is in my opinion, very, very interesting. Um, uh, so when I motivated this, this, this talk today, um, so I, uh, we have this, this we, we need edge computing. Why, what do we need edge computing for? Uh, from, the, from, the, from the vehicle networking, from the cooperative driving perspective, many of this edge computing is needed for applications like cooperative perception. Mm -hmm. We have a few sensor information. Many of this fusion, data fusion, is done by machine learning. Yeah. So eventually, we need edge computing in order to train machine learning models. Um, at the same time, where do we run this training of the machine learning models? Uh, who's, where, where, where do we do it? At the edge. So if the physical edge is not there, we replace two times physical edge by virtualized edge. So we can use machine learning for doing a better virtualized edge and we can use the virtualized edge for better, doing better learning for, for real applications, which is, which is really cool. So this is this inter, intermingled um, um, uh, AI for resilience, resilience for AI, how I, how I call that here on this, on this slide. Um, so um, I'm done. Um, so I, I hope I, I, I entertained you a little bit on, on, on what is this virtualized edge computing? Why do we need it? And maybe we can join forces here or there uh, for solving some of the small nits and problems uh, like um, uh, how to figure out um, how, car how long cars will stand at a certain intersection in order to further optimize the entire system. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> many, many, many of them. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very interesting talk and a very inspiring topic. Or just a short question, maybe a bit of a devil advocate. Uh, have you made a study calculating what's the overhead of all these features for virtual cloud, etc., mm -hmm. versus the properly deployed stationary infrastructure, where obviously the base station could, could, could know everything that is in the factory for a long time? Absolutely, absolutely. No, so. So we will never ever outperform physically deployed edge servers. Right. Impossible. Yeah? So that's the, the, the best option. Um, now they are not there. Yeah? So um, as they are not there, whatever we do will be better, yeah? better than zero. Uh, but you're right. Uh, so, so, so where exactly are we on the scale now from, from zero to perfect, perfect edge computing? Right. Um, and this very much depends um, uh, on, on two things actually. And um, uh, that is number one, 
um, the the best orchestration of 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 the of the available um, of the available resources. No? So if the orchestrator is working perfectly, oh, what is the scale for perfect here? Um, no? We can mathematically optimize that. But uh, doing that in the in the running system is non-trivial because everything changes all the time. Uh, but if the if the orchestrator works perfectly, then we can at least use the resources that are currently available in a, in a, in a very good way. Um, and second, um, uh, that is co available communication resources, um, because we use communication not only for for the means of getting the sensor data to the right place, but also for coordinating everything. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, as I mentioned, for example, for doing this, um, uh, if we if we if we prepare by prefetching data for a longer longer trip, no? mm -hmm. next micro cloud, next micro cloud, next micro cloud, we already found this kind of sweet spot for for two hops ahead. Otherwise, you use we overuse communication resources for too little benefit in the end. Uh, this can be further further studied in in in, in other in other scenarios, of course. No? Um, uh, so, so therefore, yes, these, these two um, aspects need to be need to be very, very carefully uh, combined, which also depends on which concrete communication technology is in the car. So when I'm talking about uh, communication resources, um, our cars in the simulations currently had DSRC, which is almost, sorry to say, because we had many, many talks this morning talking about uh, B2V by, by means of DSRC, which is almost useless for this. Um, there's, there's just... Yeah, uh, interference is going quickly up. CSMA-based uh, access not so not so not so useful. But if we have at least um, uh, device to device communication orchestrated by the by the by the base station, so cellular V2X, it's not so bad actually. And this is there. Yeah? 5G is there. Just the mobile edge servers missing. So we can still use the the, the G node Bs for doing many of these orchestration tasks, also orchestrating the the communication resources. And that's, that's very nicely working, actually. Thank you. Well, you partially uh, replied already, but I, I have a curiosity about uh, collective perception. So in the, in the application that you end at the bandwidth that you would need to obtain. So I think nowadays what you do is like you fuse um, data in the car and then you, you, you transmit it. But as I understand it in, in, your, in, in your proposal, there is, I understand the raw data, uh, everybody sends raw sensor data to, no. Okay, okay. I, this, this, uh, yeah. this, this, no, 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 of course it doesn't work. No? So if you get raw data from, from uh, lidar sensors, uh, all these cameras that you have in your in your car, getting the raw data out is impossible. Whatever whatever communication channel you have, um, you 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 uh, pre-process this this raw data. So you annotate features and so on, and then have a have a stream that is manageable um, to the to the next uh, to the next system to the next hop in this uh, cooperative perception processing the, screen. The the learning model is running on this pre-computed. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. which is sufficient, which is in most cases, you don't need the, the, the raw data. I mean, you don't need 100 frames per second uh, video data for, for training the machine learning model. That's good enough if you have some frames, some keyframes, plus some, some additional features. Okay. It was actually the same question. Same question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a similar question about the communication stuff, but the, first of all, thank you very much. It was a really, really motivating talk. I was thinking about the fact that traffic lights in big cities today are connected. So you may have information from there that could be very useful, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you get this information, uh, if you get this information. Um, uh, uh, before moving to Berlin, I, I've been to uh, this uh, Paderborn University. And in Paderborn, um, uh, we, we tried multiple times. Um, uh, so we had the right context to the to the city, and um, we had the right context to the to the people responsible for all the traffic lights in the in the city. But still, even even we had a very good relationship, even a project together, we were not able to get an interface, simple interface where we can simply get what is the switching cycle of these traffic lights, which is not constant, you know, right? Um, uh, they are also doing lots of predictions um, uh, using 
I don't know, preference uh, from buses and uh, uh, pedestrians pushing these, these buttons and also using some, some induction loops for, for counting cars and then updating their, their switching cycles. So what you need would be an immediate information about the next red is coming within n seconds. The next green is coming within n seconds. If you get it, you can, you can easily integrate it. It's just one component in this optimization model. Um, which would be perfect. No? I, then, then you can top some of this twelve time prediction and just replace it with this information. Right. I mean, technical cities that may be interested in talking to you if, if you are interested. Absolutely, absolutely. And my second question was about a uh, in a city that you studied. A, what is the percentage of a uh, vehicles that participate to the system that uh, makes the whole thing a uh, relevant? <sighs> <laughs> this is a this is an awesome question. I, I love it. Um, um, let me let me answer. I have two answers actually. Um, but let me answer first with something I observed already. Yeah? So uh, we have been taking part um, many many years back, um, um, maybe fifteen years back, um, uh, in a project um, that was called SimTV. Um, uh, that was we had um, some 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 project partners that were uh, Audi in the city of Ingolstadt, the headquarters of Audi, uh, the city of Ingolstadt as well. Um, um, and what we tried at that time was a green speed green light speed advisory system. Um, yeah, so indicating to the to the, to the cars um, uh, what is a good speed that you have to drive so to get the next green so to get a green wave through the through the city. Yeah? And in this case, by the way. The, the city participated and they allowed to put some 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 measures to the to the traffic lights and um, um, there was a big 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 showcase a uh, big big event um, uh, even some some of the of uh, some some people from the ministry were coming from from Germany so to to see what's what's going on and they wanted to showcase it and with very few cars maybe some 20 cars or so um, equipped with this technology and the cars were going and the impact was zero. Why that? Because they didn't close the streets for other traffic. Yeah, and um, what, what happens if, if you if you um, uh, green light speed advisory? If if you get an advisory, you are supposed to go forty kilometers per hour in order to get a perfect green wave. Mm -hmm. Even so, there's fifty kilometers per hour allowed, and everybody goes sixty anyhow. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So everybody was overtaking. And then queuing up at the red light, and you ended up in the in the traffic jam behind. So the impact was zero. And that was also when we started looking at uh, what is the minimum penetration rate of this technology in the market, and not only penetration rate of the technology, but also how do we motivate, incentivize drivers exactly to do so, right? which is a different story. Um, and meanwhile, there have been lots of studies exactly in this direction. So looking at penetration rates, minimum penetration rates, and so on and so forth. So the advantage for this virtualized edge computing is that you don't kind of need a minimum penetration rate mm -hmm. in order to provide services. Because let's assume everybody who's not participating is just not there. So they don't use the service, they don't provide services. So yeah, if, yeah, but you still have the cost of the communications and they, uh, therefore a uh, trade-off will not yeah. be the same, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Um, the, 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 less, the less participants you have, so there's a, there is eventually there's a speed up. Right? The more participate, the, the, the higher the speed up you get. Mm -hmm. It's also going to the same direction when we reach these optimality criterion. Um, <laughs> right? The more, but this is, yeah, this is unfortunately not a question that we, alone as, as engineers can can answer so we need a lot of more uh, ingredients here um, particularly something like incentive systems uh, and so on which is coming from from different fields of research um, um, in order to motivate people to to join no? um, um, why don't we have these rc as a, as a safety system mm -hmm. today i i don't know i can only say i don't know we have researched for 15 years on this and um I don't know. Nobody was willing to do a first step. Politics was not willing to do some mandating. Um, uh, car makers were not willing to to invest early. Um, no, they just got this this uh, uh, money from EU to to um, do something. Um, and the customer is not willing to pay for the first car having a technology that nobody else has. 
Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, so it's uh, it's um, it's um, more a question of um, um, pu public acceptance, possibly. Uh, so how do we get it into the market? But you are right. right? This is a very big deal for many technology questions. You know, tons of tons of excellent technology went down the into the trash bucket because nobody was using it, even though it was possible. It could be that the service providers may be interested in it. not only the security service providers, but <coughs> others that would benefit from that. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the things you have. Oh, oh, I mean, your, your starting point, which is that it doesn't exist today, is a, a, a VHP or one. So we are, we are working on with Andrea and other colleagues on a, on a, a different models in order to promote that the service providers will invest on this deployment because we know that the telcos won't. They cannot. Uh, financially, today, they cannot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know what you, what, you, what you mean, but also here I'm not 100% sure who, I mean, there's, there's a lot of competition in this, in this market, even so it's not yet out there. No, it's mm -hmm. pre-competition, so to say. Um, no, so the car makers want to have a share, the service providers want to have a yeah. share, the telcos want to have a share, um, but nobody's doing the first step. Thank you. I, there's one more question from the back. I think that we should stop. <laughs> Sorry, but we can see you can stop. Thank you so much for your very interesting talk. And uh, we love, we love the distributed system with the different challenges we can have in the distributed system. So I think it relates to this virtual edge computing. But it makes me back to the last talk. You know, we've been working on ad hoc development last 15, 20 years. We don't see yet here. Like you say, nobody is deploying, nobody is making action on that because simply because it, 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 it's costly and they, 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 they can't make a spring car on the road, equip it with B2B. If there's no car around, how we get it, it's, it's useless. So we're not coming, we're not there yet. So I started to believe that actually similar 5G or, or at least infrastructure, I to we communication make things faster, mm. deployment faster. Mm. And okay, let's talk about just cellular network. We can we can talk about the edge in the cellular. We can have far edge. We can have cloud. Okay, cloud. If we do the processing in the cloud, we have obviously longer delay, communication delay, but probably faster processing delay. And if you really see the the, the real delay, I think today is processing delay is more problematic than communication. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going back to question, are we really want to use B2B in some way? I understand there are some very interesting, important applications like platooning, like collusion avoidance, Kafka. that's no question. But besides that, are we going to use vehicles and for B2B communication for other types of application like edge computing? And this is just question on, on, on yeah, yeah. Are we more going to be similar communication and infrastructure to vehicular system and pop uh, and, and then you think all of these advantages bringing it slicing edge and then so on so on and then maybe a little bit we to be here and there that you need and something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, I know what you, i know what you mean and um this is a very important point because this um, reminds me that I did not answer fully answer uh, the previous question, uh, actually, um, talking about the key players. So there's new players coming to the market. And that is exactly what, 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 what your comment actually uh, goes to. And that is operators of shuttle buses, um, operators of um, uh, semi-automated cars, um, car sharing cars, and so on. Um, so they will probably also looking for addition. I mean, they have these autonomous shuttles on the road anyhow. And they are looking for additional business perspectives. Uh, and for them, it's very easy. Um, then also this 12 time prediction is becoming so easy because uh, we can do lots of sensors in there and we, we know about the, the routes they take anyhow. And so many things become easier. Um, and if they jump this train and uh, say, okay, we, we see that as an opportunity, we now have edge servers on wheels. Um, autonomous cars, autonomous shuttles, um, no? um, fleet operators, not, not just single ones, fleet operators. Um, that would be awesome. And this is then indeed not, then we are not talking about uh, every V2V communication that is not so relevant. It's then uh, one of the shuttle buses to the other shuttle bus. And that's probably not even direct 
wireless communications that is via via 5G network. Um, um, and you're right, no? but still they are in, in, in proximities that are maybe within one 5G cell or neighboring cells. So data rates are good, uh, delays are low. So that is, that is possibly also uh, a very good idea. So, so yes, there will be new players. Um, hope, I, I, but again, we be looking crystal ball. So um, <laughs> um, if this takes up, I don't know. Um, and one final, one final comment. Um, I have to, I have to, I have to close. Um, uh, one final comment. Um, also for the five G technology that we have currently in the standard. So currently we're looking at release 16, 17 coming. Um, um, if you're looking into the into the standardized um, uh, cellular networks, mm -hmm. only part of it is deployed, um, and this is because um, uh, the complexity of the of the of the system. Now, um, uh, operators decide which parts of to deploy because they think this makes a business. Um, and I remember also a project I was I was involved in twenty years ago. Um, uh, Cocar it was called, um, and we looked at that time. LT was not yet there. We talked about UMTS at that time, 3G networks. And one of the key features of, of, of uh, UMTS, if you remember, was uh, getting MBMS as a, as a technology into the, into the market, cellular multicasting. And we had so many great ideas what to do with cellular multicasting, also for safety messaging, by the way, between cars. But it was never there, never ever, never ever. It was in the standard from day one, never ever deployed. Meanwhile, for 5, 4G also not. 5G, it's central part. Now we have it finally. Um, and this is also, a, this, 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 this standardization process is sometimes, I'm not part, I, I'm very proud that I'm not part of the standardization. Um, so it's sometimes political, I don't know, fights rather than thinking about technology. Yeah? So um, yeah, we deviated a lot from, 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 from science and technology becoming more to political questions, but they are, they are there, yeah, they are there. So I shut up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>